Welcome boom. to the show, Max. Thanks for having me. There we go. Three, two, one, boom. <laughs> Here we are, dude. So I'm glad we finally were able to make this happen. Me too. So glad. We've been in communication for a little while, and uh, I'm glad I was able to catch you while you're here in L.A. right before your book comes out. Thank you so much. Which we're, of course, going to talk about. And, uh, you know, the purpose of this show is to share with people principles for health, motivation, quality of life, spirituality, all that. So as I told you before we started recording, I don't have too specific of an agenda. We're just going to see where it goes. But something I definitely want to cover is everything in your book. Cool. It's about brain health and, and diet and all of that. But I really want to go deeply into what's going to be covered in your film, Breadhead. Yeah. Which is currently in production. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Well, we, we just achieved a, a final cut of the documentary. There's still a lot of work to be done. But Oh, nice. Yeah, we, we ha- we're waiting to hear from the you know the film festivals right now to see what our distribution options look like. Dude, sick. Um, yeah, I've been working on it for a long time. So Yeah, well, I'm, I'm all for it. And uh, that's why I like having people like you on the show. You know, it's, it's funny, too. We were talking about before we started recording. I haven't really covered the whole grain and brain and like brain health and dementia and all that stuff. So I'm really excited to get into it. Tell the listeners what motivated you to start really looking into lifestyle and diet as it pertains to brain health. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my story is pretty similar to yours in that I was, you know, on a completely different life trajectory than what, you know, where my life is currently heading. Um, I was a uh, journalist and um, TV presenter and producer. Uh, I was actually living in Los Angeles working for a TV network that Al Gore founded. Um, and I worked for them for, you know, five, six years, really sort of honing my storytelling sensibilities with the best of the best. And when I left Current TV to try to figure out where I was going to go with my career, I was about, I don't know, 28 years old. Uh, at the time, my mother <clears throat> began calling me from New York and complaining of uh, brain fog, essentially. And, you know, that's not something that I'd ever really heard uh that that term was pretty foreign to me i guess at the time so you hadn't experienced it yourself well you know i guess it wasn't in my vernacular but yeah i actually in retrospect i did experience it quite frequently okay you know i was i've always been a really health conscious guy and um i really built my diet around what i perceived to be um you know healthy you know foods really um i went a little bit uh, two nuts perhaps with the whole grains because I, I used to really um, consider like anything white, for example, white rice, you know, I would, I would not touch. I would consider that to be essentially toxic. Whereas if you put a brown rice bowl in front of me, I would eat the whole thing and probably go back for seconds. Um, so the brain fog that I experienced, yeah, I would, you know, constantly my blood sugar would be a roller coaster throughout the day and I would find myself starving by the time I got to my next meal, um, chronically snacking throughout the day. Uh, and you know, when you are hooked on glucose, which is one of the brain's primary fuel sources, um, and you sort of have that, that relative bout of hypoglycemia where you start to feel that hanger sensation that people, people refer to, we tend to reach for carbs to treat the withdrawal that we're feeling from glucose. And that actually tricks the brain into making us think that sugar and carbs are our friends, but they're really not. I mean, you know, we're, we're not meant to have energy levels that feel so inconsistent. That's not, that's not normal. Um, although it feels like it is today. So anyway, so your mom is, yeah. we're going to, de- we're going to go like hardcore into that stuff because I'm realizing a lot of people don't know about it. So your mom started to experience this brain fog at the time you had experienced, but weren't necessarily cognizant of the fact that that's what was going on. I just thought that that was like a normal, that's life. That's life. Yeah. yeah. So when my mom actually started to verbally, complain that her brain wasn't you know suddenly working the way that she had been used to it working um that was like unsettling to say the least so i was in between jobs and i started spending more and more time back in new york city and when i was with my brothers and and you know all the whole family you know when we would get together we actually noticed that my mom's gait changed the way that she walked wow you know my mom's a new yorker and new yorkers walk a lot they walk very fast and my mom's stride had sort of become more compact. She, start, she started to, me and my brothers were, would actually joke that my mom started to look like a zombie, like the way a zombie walks. Wow. Yeah, and it wasn't, it wasn't that exaggerated, but it was just such a, a shock 
that we had no precedent in our family, you know, to describe that we're actually poking fun in a really horrible, ignorant way, you know. But um, her cognition also changed. I liken what I saw in my mom to sort of like when you have a web browser with too many open tabs, you know, try to play a video, it starts to stutter. Um, my mom seemed like her processing speed had slowed significantly. And, you know, the term dementia or anything like that, that was not in my vocabulary. I was, in fact, you know, my, the, the, the word dementia to me, all it evoked was the, uh, there was like an, there was like an Adams Family character um, named Dementia that was actually, I think, Uncle Fester's crush in one of the movies. And that's really all that came to mind when I thought of that term. And then Alzheimer's disease, I just thought was something that only old people got. So in my, you know, in the ignorance uh, that really dominated my um, perception of neurodegeneration, brain fog, memory problems, things like that, I decided to go with my mom to the top neurology departments in the country. We were very fortunate to be able to do that. And so I started traveling with her. We started in New York. We found it, you know, we couldn't really get to any kind of diagnosis. Um, we ended up going to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And we ended up uh, over the course of a week at the Cleveland Clinic. And it was there at the Cleveland Clinic that um, my mom was diagnosed for the first time with a neurodegenerative disease. And uh, What did they call it? Well, her symptoms were very nebulous. And so she, was, she wasn't diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and she wasn't diagnosed with classical Parkinson's disease. She was diagnosed with some sort of, you know, Parkinson's plus syndrome, which is basically, you know, when you have a little bit of Parkinson's disease with, you know, perhaps the symptoms of another neurodegenerative disease. But regardless of what the, what the label is that they put on the disease, they prescribe the same drugs. So my mom was put on drugs for both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease that week at the Cleveland Clinic. And I didn't know what... Damn, probably hardcore drugs too. Well, they're not... They're actually... They're, they're like chemical band-aids. They work pretty similarly to antidepressant drugs. Actually. Oh, okay. They, yeah, they just... They I imagine like a Parkinson's medication being like super hardcore, like chemo or something. No, no, no. So, oh, okay. so the gold standard uh, treatment for Parkinson's disease is a drug called Cinemet, which is essentially just L-DOPA. It's pure dopamine. So in Parkinson's mm, disease. Yum. Actually, that's funny, dude. I take as a nootropic from time to time. I cycle through something called Deprinil. Interesting. Which is, um, I don't know, it's not a precursor. I guess it's like... Uh, motivates the production of more dopamine and it's a it's a parkinson's medication but you can kind of get it wow. bitcoiny sort of online <laughs> you know what i mean yeah we could talk about it later but yeah it's uh i actually am about to order it again because i i haven't taken it in a couple of years but yeah it's sir it works as an antidepressant for mm -hmm. like regular people that mm -hmm. aren't clinically depressed but just want to be super happy yeah. especially people over 40 like myself so anyway yeah you guys get the meds so we get the medication um and before I knew what the meds were for, I Googled the medications right there in the hospital pharmacy. And um, yeah, like, it, you know, Alzheimer's disease was not even mentioned in the, in the, in the physician's office. Um, but when I realized that my mom was on drugs for this awful disease that, you know, I knew barely anything about, um, I basically, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had a panic attack. Um, and it sort of culminated later that night in the Holiday Inn that we were staying in where I started really sort of Googling and digging into the research and looking into, you know, exactly what these drugs are doing and what they do for the disease and the, and the, and the typical dr disease trajectory or prognosis. Um, and, yeah, I mean, Alzheimer's disease is a horrible, horrible disease. You know, there's no, there's no efficacious treatment, really. I mean, these drugs essentially just kind of, tr you know, attempt to mask the symptoms by increasing the amount of just one of the neurotransmitters that is, you know, uh, depleted in Alzheimer's disease um, because the neurons that produce it are slowly dying. So essentially... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. But again, my mom was never diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Right. So, the, so the doctor right. basically prescri prescribes these two drugs and sends you on your way. Right. Um, and that to me was really uh, unsettling. I, I, you know, have since. Dude, I'd, <laughs> I'd, that's the thing with, with Western medicine, man. Yeah. Is, I mean, I, I've, I've had a situation for the past couple of years where I get 
like kind of dizzy slash car sick vertigo kind of shit going mm. on. I'm constantly working on my health, getting labs and all that. But I went, you know, finally I was like, all right, I've been to all my naturopaths and healers and all this stuff. I'm going to go straight Western med. And I went to, uh, you know, general practitioner. He referred me out to a couple of ex experts as they do. Uh, and I started talking to a few of the huge experts and they have nothing. <laughs> they have no information. Yeah. It's just, there's nothing, especially nothing about causation. You know, yeah. it's just like, well, let me look into what drugs we can put you on. And it is frustrating because you know that it's not normal for a human being to fall apart. We're not actually wired that way. Yeah. Unless, you know, there's something, you know, birth defect or something like that. But I mean, if you're, if you're born healthy and you live relatively healthy, we've come to sort of accept this false idea that you're supposed to lose your freaking mind as you get older. Right. Like, and dementia is not a normal aspect of aging. <laughs> exactly. It's not. So you were, this you were, so you were pretty freaked out and pissed off that they were just like, cool, let's throw some drugs at it. Yeah. And you know, I was, I was hoping to find, you know, that these drugs had, you know, a di what's called a disease modifying effect, meaning that they would slow trajectory perhaps, but no, they're essentially just, you know, biochemical band-aids. Um, and so, I mean, that was a traumatic experience. I was, uh, you know, it was the first time in my life I'd ever had a panic attack. I um, basically, the world seemed Were to... Were you like losing your me. shit in the hospital or what? It was in the, it was actually like in the hotel room that night when I oh, was, okay. when I felt at once overwhelmed by all the information was out there, but then completely, you know, ignorant and helpless. Mm -hmm. uh, like my own... I felt afraid for my own ignorance in the matter. And, you know, I'm, I think, a pretty typical millennial in the sense that I don't like feeling like things are out of my control. Um, and so that right there, you know, with my own mom, um, in that moment, I just felt like, yeah, like I couldn't breathe. And it was probably one of the worst sensations I've ever had. And it was justified because, you know, I love my mom and uh, dementia is a horrible disease. So anyway... I, I've always been really interested in nutrition and fitness, and it was sort of like a side passion of mine. And um, when I basically learned, you know, all this about the drugs, I started to look and to see if there were maybe any other options in terms of diet and lifestyle. I, that hunch that I had was also sort of, I was tipped off because my grandmother, my maternal grandma on my mom's side, my mom's mom, was 94 at the time, and she was cognitively normal. So I had this hunch that there had to have been something that changed in between my grandmother's generation and my mom's generation that led to my mom developing this mental monstrosity and my grandma being cognitively fine. I mean, of course, they, you know, share genes. So I wanted to know really, you know, what could be done to help my mom from a, you know, more holistic perspective. And then also at the same time, what could be done in my own life to prevent myself from ever having to, you know, undergo what my mom went through. Um, and so I just began digging in. I, you know, I went straight to PubMed, which is something that I've been sort of comfortable with using f for as long as I could remember because of my, you know, my early interest in health and nutrition. And I began looking into the primary literature. You know, I, start, I started searching PubMed for Alzheimer's disease, nutrition, nutrients, micronutrients, macronutrients, um, relationships between Alzheimer's disease and other chronic diseases. Um, so the relationship between Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes. My mom was never a type 2 diabetic, but I learned that, you know, by the time you uh, get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or even pre-diabetes, you've been hyperinsulinemic for 10 years prior to that point. What does that mean? Chronically elevated insulin. Oh. Yeah. So my mom uh, is from a generation where they were told for decades that fat is bad. I'm sure you've covered, you know, fat and... A bit, yeah. You know, it's funny though, dude surprisingly I, I think because i'm so deeply invested in all the health stuff and i'm looking at the the research all the time um you'd think that most people know that like the low fat craze was one of the worst things that ever happened to the american diet yeah so feel free to go into that it has been talked about but i still find people that i meet sometimes out on the street oh i listen to your show cool and then in the conversation like i realize oh shit they don't even know about this yeah some of the stuff i think that us like more health nut people are aware of still yeah. the general population doesn't know so yeah so go ahead with that well the dietary guidelines that have that have guided the the diets of you know my mom and americans and people around the world for the past 50 years uh 
have been total bullshit. And that's what, you know, all the evidence, you know, seems to be um, suggesting. And, you know, it began in the 50s when Americans were in a frenzy over the seeming, the, you know, the, there was a seeming epidemic of heart disease, which culminated when President Eisenhower had a heart attack and was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. And at that point, you know, it was the dawn of nutrition science. So there were infinite unknowns. We knew essentially nothing. Um, and one scientist and epidemiologist named Ansel Keys basically emerged from the quiet halls of academia with this notion that it was fat that was responsible for the nation's epidemic of heart disease. And he basically performed a bunch of correlational studies, uh, most famously the seven country study where he drew up basically a correlation between the fat consumption and specifically um, later on in his career, their saturated fat consumption and their rates of heart disease. Um, but he had a profound selection bias for one. He omitted data that was available from countries where they were consuming a lot of fat um, and they had no epidemic of heart disease. So take, for example, the French who love their omelets, who love their cheese, who love their butter. We call this the French paradox. Um, but it's not really much of a paradox. It's just that the notion that there's a relationship between saturated fat per se and heart disease never existed to begin with. Um, so, he, he, he <laughs> we, so we just real quick, we, we have, I used to have this, you know, a lot of people still do this sort of, um, cartoon like interpretation of saturated fats and fats and how they uh, correlate to heart disease yeah. and, and i think how a lot of people picture it is you remember you remember the phrase people used to use like oh here's a heart attack like a cheeseburger or something be like oh yeah. there's a heart attack waiting to happen exactly. or something like that and and i think that people used to and some still do think about when you're eating those fats that they become hard in your arteries and right. veins and then right. they clog them up and then you have a heart attack and you die it's from the fat and right. then a friend of mine pointed out to me that the the one premise that totally annihilates that is that fat melts at body temperature. Yeah. So there's actually no way a living body can have fat stuck in it because it's a liquid. Yeah. You know, so that that was like one thing I was like, oh, yeah. so that's not it, you know, so, so anyway, carry yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, that's definitely true, but that's just not the way that our biology works anyway. You know, it's, um, our bodies are this dynamic chemistry lab that transforms things, you know, breaks apart molecules and transform the, trans, transforms them into others. Uh, <clears throat> we turn sugar into fat very easily. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, that, that essentially paved the way for policy over the past 50 right. years. What do you think motivated him to make a bogus studies like that? was do you think he was i love conspiracies you know yeah. because most of them are true <laughs> but do you think he was like paid off by different manufacturers or companies or like wh why did he put out this bunk information about heart disease and have his studies so skewed and biased like that like, yeah oh, like omitting the high fat diet people that are doing just fine etc yeah that's a really good question i mean he did enjoy vacationing in the mediterranean region of the world and a lot of his early observations on people in the Mediterranean, um, which paved basically the road for the, the Mediterranean dietary pattern, which now sort of has a halo effect around it in the medical literature, solely because of his early research. Um, that stems from him vacationing in on a little island called Crete um, just after World War II during Lent, when he observed you know people in the Mediterranean that seemed to be thriving. And he noticed that they were you know eating diets that were that didn't have a lot of meat and that were predominantly grain based um, in that little sort of cross section of an island just after World War II during Lent. It was a particularly lean time. Um, and anybody who's ever been to the Mediterranean, uh, I mean, sadly, now the Western dietary pattern is bleeding, you know, all around the world and spreading like wildfire. But they enjoy fatty cuts of meat uh, in the Mediterranean. So he had a very sort of... Um, you know, I would say it was a, it just was a, it was a, it was a cross-sectional observation that wasn't fully representative of the, uh, the way people in the Mediterranean truly eat. Um, so we don't know if he was motivated for 
clandestine reasons or something. Well, I think that he was what... <laughs> or so, is he just misled? I mean, I think a lot of these scientists and doctors and stuff come up with these theories and they just... It's its what they believe is right at the time. Yeah. And they're taking their best guess and they put two and two together and they come up with these conclusions. But there are cases where someone's like, hey, maybe you know you could do it like this and we'll give you a little kickback or some stock. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of that going on. Well, no, there's... I mean, you look at the whole food pyramid yeah. like, and who you know informed and motivated some of the choices there. Absolutely. Well, it. I think, I think it in part stems from the fact that as you uh, elucidated earlier, it's a very easy sell for both scientists and the public that fat can clog your arteries because we had fat... And, you know, every housewife knows what it's like to pour grease down a cold drain. You know, it's a dangerous proposition. It clogs your drains. Cold and, drain. Yeah. Unlike your arteries, which are never cold exactly. if you're alive. Exactly. And then at the same time, concurrently, you know, there were these massive food manufacturers like Procter & Gamble that were manufacturing saturated fat-free vegetable oils. Right. Um, and then the sugar industry was this burgeoning, you know, force that ended up actually funding a lot of the early research that seemed to prove that <clears throat> sat that fat and saturated fat weren't harmful to the heart. They were paying off scientists that in today's money was the equivalent of fifty thousand dollars, picking their studies and literally paying them off to take the blame off of fat or to take the blame off of sugar rather and put it on fat. Interesting. When there is data suggesting that the relationship between sugar consumption and heart disease had always correlated more strongly than the relationship between heart disease and fat. So Ansel Keys basically, and you know, there, this story has been talked about in a few other books. Gary Taubes was one of the early whistleblowers uh, and researchers really behind it. But, um, but yeah, he was able to sort of implant this idea. It was a really easy sell for the American public and a desperate government looking for solutions when Eisenhower had just had this heart attack. He was able to implant this idea into the American Heart Association at the time, which was this little little known professional organization. And that eventually gave the organization the ability to uh, get funding from actually Procter and Gamble, which was at the <laughs> see same there time, you go. Yeah, okay, early, this is good stuff. Yeah, early funding from Pro from Procter and Gamble, which invested I think it was a million dollars back then. Dude, I get so resentful toward corruption. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. like really pisses me off. Yeah, this year I'm actually doing. I've got three shows planned that are I wouldn't say political, but definitely like charged. One is on vaccines, hmm. one's on geoengineering, and the other one's on GMOs. So I'm glad that we're covering this stuff yeah. because. Most people don't know this. People believe what they see on TV and what they're told in school. I mean, I remember home ec or whatever class it was and being shown the food pyramid and, you know, I'm yeah. eating half a loaf of freaking bread a day thinking, wow, I'm awesome. You know, it's like I, that used so, to be me. so much misinformation. Yeah. And I know that there's other motives behind it. It's just in human nature. If people are greedy rather than they are caring and compassionate oftentimes, you know, so yeah. when you have the heads of these companies and, and advertising and all of that stuff, there's a lot of misinformation, some of it by mistake, and then we learn better, and some of it's on purpose. Yeah, a lot yeah. of it is on purpose, actually, and it yeah. continues today. If you think that this sort of nefarious meddling of the food industry and, and nutritional policy is behind us, it's absolutely not. Um, and that really paved the way for my mom's diet, all, you know, all the people of her generation. Right. And what, the way that we grew up. I mean, I grew up consuming margarine because it was supposed to be the heart-healthy alternative <sighs> to artery-clogging butter. I grew up, you know, I remember the corn oil sitting at the stove in my in, in, in <laughs> Totally, my dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was in like one of those clear, like giant water bottle looking yep. things kind of, yeah. My mom used to fry lean chicken breasts in, bread cr in breadcrumbs, you know, wheat flour, uh, in this corn oil and serve it to, it was a meal that would literally win the heart of any dietitian of the early 90s because it was sat, it was free of saturated fat and it was full of these you know corn oils which they were telling us were great for us right yeah and wheat flour which had no fat it was just wheat right which is of course benign because we were told thanks to the food pyramid that for health we've got to eat seven to eleven servings of, of grains per day can you imagine yeah so all right, so your mom, your mom's having these issues. Mm -hmm. You get together with her. You guys start traveling around, talking to the experts. The best solution they have 
is drugs yeah. and that's you know if that's the only solution that's what you do i do it sometimes when that's all i've got to work with <laughs> uh then you start to do some research after you get over your initial shock and you start to dig into the history of all of this food and stuff so what and then about your mom's diet and how that came about what are some of the worst things that we typically eat now for the brain like let's get specific into yeah. the different grains and the whole gluten thing and all that yeah um so you know i think first of all we live in a time where 50 percent of the u.s population is either pre-diabetic or diabetic which what that essentially is is carbohydrate intolerance and today, even though the food pyramid has been retired, thankfully, we are still fed this notion that grains have to be included at every meal for good health. It's part of the USDA's My Plate uh, paradigm. And there's no good evidence for that. There's no good evidence to say that grains improve health, actually. There was a, a, a research study put out by Cochrane, which is this international organization known for their unbiased systematic reviews of medical lit literature. They do this in partnership with the World Health Organization. And when looking at randomized control trials, which are the kinds of trials required to prove cause and effect, there's no good evidence out there that grains, even whole grains, improve health. And yet we're told that they improve health, right? And especially for a population that is essentially carbohydrate intolerant, what these foods basically do, and especially in their most commonly consumed form, they send your blood sugar through the roof, and to clean up the mess, your pancreas has to secrete insulin, which is, you know, this ancestral hormone. It's one of the most conserved hormones in the animal kingdom, meaning it's one of the oldest hormones that exists. Because for the vast majority of our evolution, it was essential to survival. It helped us to store fat and store calories uh, when calories were plentiful for, you know, impending winters, essentially. Today, that lever seems to be jammed permanently on because your average American consumes about 300 grams of carbohydrates per day. And what that does is that causes... Damn. Yeah, it's a lot. Dude. That's a lot. How many grams of carbs do you consume per day? 50, 60, maybe, yeah. at that? Yeah. The average American consumes 300 grams of carbs, if wow. not more. If not more. Wow. No wonder everyone has road rage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and is depressed. Exactly. <laughs> oh, God, dude. Yeah. So, I mean, what happens when insulin is chronically elevated, okay, it's the body's chief anabolic hormone. So, it causes things to grow. It shuttles glucose into your muscle tissue. But for the most part, I mean, your muscles can only hold about, I mean, the, the, your entire body, uh, all of the skeletal muscle in your body can only hold about 400 grams of sugar. So, I mean, 300 grams of sugar day in and day out in a population that's become largely sedentary, where else is that fat going to go? It's going to basically go to your fat tissue, which can store a virtually unlimited amount of, of excess calories. So, we've got this anabolic hormone that's chronically, ele that's chronically elevated. Um, and what that does is it, it wreaks havoc on our body's metabolism. So, that, this is why so many people have become essentially insulin resistant, because insulin is chronically elevated. And the way that this works is that you know, cells basically have receptors on them that provide the cell sort of like ears to the outside world. And what they do is they listen for biochemical signals. Insulin is one of, you know, the body's strongest biochemical signals. It signals to your cells that food is abundant. When signals become too loud or too frequent, cells basically protect themselves by reducing the amount of receptors for those signals on their surface. And so that's how cells become insulin resistant over time. And what that does is that drives up inflammation in the body. Um, and eventually, after about 10 years, it causes your blood sugar to be chronically elevated. And having chronically elevated blood sugar is associated with a smaller brain, worse memory function, a larger waist, higher levels of inflammation. All told, um, there was a great uh, review published by Melissa Schilling in the journal um, I think it was the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease or Alzheimer's and Dementia, where she basically looked at, you know, looked at the research and um, speculated that 40% of Alzheimer's cases may be owed to hyper hyperinsulinemia alone. So basically chronically wow. elevated insulin. Yeah, 40%. Dude, this is such <laughs> this is such a mind F because essentially what you're saying is that eating an inflammatory diet. Yeah. 
which is these seed oils, which we're going to go more into. Yeah. Inflammatory bad oils. Yeah, that's right? one of, that's definitely another okay. part of it. Yeah. And and grains, mm -hmm. very inflammatory. Uh, eating the inflammatory diet then messes with your whole insulin situation yeah. and your blood sugar, right? Yeah. yeah. So you become pre-diabetic or diabetic, mm -hmm. and then that causes more inflammation, then that spreads up to your brain, to your head, right? And then that blood sugar issue and the insulin, all that starts tweaking your head. I'm giving like the Jeff Spicoli, might be before someone's time. That's a movie called High Time. You should <laughs> check it out. The Jeff Spicoli <laughs> interpretation of what you're saying, which I have to do to understand things, you know, and then I think the audience appreciates it because if they're not as brainiac as the guest, <laughs> I, you know, it's my job to be the translator, even though you're speaking English. I love it. But just so I can understand it in simple terms. So... And then the issues with dementia and Alzheimer's, all this, are really diseases of inflammation as well. Yeah. And so if someone just followed the Western medicine model of care mm -hmm. and treatment for that, they'd be just knocking down symptoms with, um, with medication, yeah. right? Yeah. But continue, you know, unbeknownst to them, continuing to eat a diet and Absolutely. having a lifestyle that's totally pro-inflammatory Absolutely. and just wondering why they keep getting disease after disease, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy. That whole, the cascade effect is just insane. Chronically elevated insulin is now being thought of as sort of uh, a unifying theory of modern disease. Mm. That all modern diseases, the, you know, the, the ideology, which is like the causal, um, you know, underpinnings of these diseases that seem to be skyrocketing these days, you know, in the modern world um, that we didn't have so much of in antiquity are owed to chronically elevated insulin because our diets have become basically packed with ultra processed, you know, energy dense, nutrient poor carbs. Um, and of course, the ultra processed oils, which are now squeezed into every crevice of the modern food supply. Now that you're learning some of this stuff, have you had the experience? Because I'm, I'm assuming you shop at the health food store and you read labels and you, you know, you're probably Always. very aware of what you're eating. Do you ever walk into like a traditional grocery store and just go, oh my God, <laughs> it's like day of the dead in here. It's, oh, holy crap. I'm always shocked that people are still eating all that food. I'm yeah. like, oh shit, no one got the memo. Yeah. You walk in like a Safeway or whatever, essentially, I mean, you have your little organic pockets and you know, it's good. There's some, there's some healthier food that's infiltrating the, the massive garbage there, but it's literally, it's probably like 90% corn. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's just made of corn, mm -hmm. sugar, and seed oils. Like everything in there is yeah. inflammatory and GMO and just so toxic. And you can even... If you if you don't spend time in those big grocery stores for a while and you're, you're shopping in little organic markets or even Whole Foods, have you ever noticed when you walk in one of those grocery stores, it stinks like chemicals? <laughs> like if you walk in Ralph's down the street on Wilshire, dude, yeah. and you haven't been in a store. Because I go in one of those stores, I don't know, maybe once a year or something. Oh, damn, I need to water or some toilet paper or something, right? I'm probably not going to buy food there. But you walk in there, it's just like, whoo, it's just off-gassing toxicity yeah. it's yeah. so crazy the contrast there it's horrible but you know to be totally honest whole foods is not innocent either when it comes to uh you know selling f pretty unhealthy food I mean, if, if you, <laughs> you know what there, you know what my nickname is for whole foods what? canola foods <laughs> exactly 100%. a lot of canola oil a lot of god canola. bless them yeah. you know they're, they're it's it's an improvement but yeah you're right yeah well five percent of canola oil contains trans fats due to the processing so I mean, your average American consumes about 20 grams of canola oil per day, which is the which basically provides one gram on average of trans fat, and there's no safe level of trans fat consumption. So can, canola oil is really toxic. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it might be somewhat better than some of the other oils, but it's not. It's really not better. Well, it's less bad actually. The, the, the thing proper, that's always tripped me out so. about canola oil is that. I mean, beside the fact that it's just in everything, yeah. even health food. And sometimes I'll crave like um, corn chips or something. I want to get some guacamole or salsa. I'll literally go th in Erewhon even at the health food store. I go through every single corn chip that's deep fried. Yeah. And all the organic ones are still canola oil, which maybe it's not, it's not GMO canola oil, yeah. but it's still super inflammatory. But what's weird about canola oil is it was brought to my attention some years ago. There's no canola plant. Right. There's not like a canola farm somewhere. Yeah. It's not a real thing. It's made from like a rapeseed yeah. oil, I think. Is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. Um, 
and it's it's like it's the got its name from the Canadian oil company hmm. and they just call it canola oil and you just think like oh that's from a canola bush or whatever yeah. it's like no it's actually like a, a fake manufactured type of oil it's not corn oil they well they all are i mean prior to 100 years ago we didn't have the chemistry labs and the machinery required to create oils from these seeds right and so canola oil right. it's horrible for you and isn't it true that if you have any, because I think where people get duped here is that all of these rancid inflammatory oils are technically vegetable oils, right? They come at some point from a plant, which would be a vegetable, okay? Yeah. When I think of something vegetable oils, in my mind, I'm like, oh, cool. They uh, smashed up a bunch of broccoli <laughs> and carrots and beets and kale and like got some oil out of it. That's got to be good, right? Yeah. We don't realize it's called vegetable oil because it comes from a seed, but in nature, the reason that seeds have a shell is to keep those oils intact, right? So that they don't get oxidized and go rancid and become dead. Right. And so anything, and this is true from what I understand of flax and chia and even some of the, you know, the seeds that actually contain a really healthy omega-3 rich fat or oil, that even those... If you buy them with the with the shell cracked or just inherently rancid, the minute they get oxygen, they become rancid. Yeah. So it's like not only do those seeds that we call vegetable oil and canola and all that, not only are they like shit oils, but they're instantly rancid because they're cracked open and become rancid and then they're cooked and like what's up with this hydrogenated oils? Yeah. That's like another level of... Those are bad. Satanic oils, those right? Those are bad. I mean, thankfully, the FDA has actually has banned those. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No so, way. Yeah, so hydrogenated oils won't be on. Yeah, I think. So uh, I can eat Oreos again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if Dude, you, pretty much any good, like good, really nasty, you know, I mean, good in a nasty way type food like that, it's always like lard, hydrogenated oil is like the first thing. And then just straight up GMO sugar or whatever, you know, it's like. Those are the things that are so addictive. So bad. Well, yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, I mean, t today, 60% of the calories that we consume come from ultra processed foods, which have exactly, you know, these kinds of oils, these kinds of, you know, pulverized grains that ba they basically take these, you know, like the wheat plant and turn basically the grain into dust, you know, which takes your body milliseconds to absorb and digest. Um, but I feel for Americans because, you know, there are food scientists that are paid a lot of money to devise ways of addicting consumers to their to their products. I mean, that's right. why these foods, you know, when you combine salt, sugar, fat, it creates a mouthfeel. It creates such a, a pleasing mm. taste and flavor that... Yum. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> but it's, I'm like, what food do I have that has all those? Yeah. But these foods are impossible to eat in moderation. Right. So and also would never exist in nature. Exactly. If you're a hunter gatherer, you're gonna find those separately, exactly. but you'd never like go out gathering and hunting for a day and be able to have such a bevy of exactly those dopamine producing uh, taste and flavors and whatnot. Right? Yeah, and the th and you could see your brain sort of in action in your own house. I mean, if you were to take a stick of butter and take a bite. A stick of butter probably wouldn't be prone to overconsumption. You know, if you take a baked potato and you eat it plain, you probably wouldn't want to eat a whole lot of that baked potato. But the minute you combine the salted butter with the baked potato, suddenly it becomes hyper palatable. You're combining right. these flavors and it pushes your brain to a bliss point beyond which, I mean, self-control is futile, essentially. Yeah. You know? So, I yeah. mean, like, for all those people that feel like they've had some kind of, like, moral failure when they try to have just a spoonful of ice cream and they find themselves having gone through the whole pint before they know it, or, like, they open up a bag of chips and they just want to have, like, one or two chips and then the bag of chips is gone. It's not their fault. You know, right. these foods are designed to be overconsumed. Right. If you're a shareholder in Frito-Lay, you're stoked. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. you're happy to pay those food scientists to make the food more addictive. Yeah. Okay, so so we've got these, you know, go, I want to keep in the frame here of the brain health, yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah. it, it's something I haven't talked about, and I'm very interested in it, and as are you, obviously. So before we move on to sugars, let's make sure we wrap a bow on the fats piece on these oils. So what are some of the oils that, 
people listening should absolutely unequivocally avoid in their diet you know without being neurotic always yeah. i always say don't don't be orthorexic and paranoid but <laughs> if you have a choice between three freaking oils for your salad dressing or whatever like which ones are good for us and which ones should we avoid really important question so the only oils that I uh, think that people should use, um, particularly liberally, is extra virgin olive oil, where there's a really strong body of evidence showing that extra virgin olive oil is a powerful anti-inflammatory. It's been shown to encourage autophagy, which is the brain's sort of garbage disposal uh, machinery. What uh, about the fake-ass olive oil, though? How do, how do we tell if we're getting the real stuff? You want to... Generally, they've, been f they've, they've found counterfeit olive oil being exported from Italy. So I tend to buy predominantly Greek extra virgin okay olive oil. that's interesting yeah <laughs> it's like the the uh, olive oil mafia pulling yeah. some back you know back alley deals there okay yeah um so yeah go for greek um and okay. greek and greek olive oil has also been found in at least one study that i've read and i can't remember where uh you know where it was published but that they found that it it contained higher levels of oleocanthal which is actually the phenol in extra virgin olive oil that has anti-inflammatory properties on par with low-dose ibuprofen. So it's... Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, without any of the negative side effects. And then what about the... Uh, it'll say like expeller-pressed or cold-pressed, extra virgin, double extra virgin. Do you know what all that stuff means or is it just marketing speak? Well, you want it cold-pressed. It usually is going to be cold-pressed. Um, and you do want it to be extra virgin. Uh you know, whether or not it's filtered, sometimes, you know, filter, unfiltered is nice to throw in a salad. You don't want to cook with filtered. Um, but extra virgin olive oil should be the only, you know, variant of extra ver of olive oil that you purchase. Do you think it's better to get your oil that comes in a darker bottle that's not, has been less susceptible to UV and less chance of being rancid? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, I, I recommend people buy their olive oil in uh, glass bottles that are darkly colored. And I like to buy my olive oil in small bottles because even though olive oil is very, uh, stable, chemically speaking, um, the, you know, the longer it's exposed to oxygen, the higher the probability that some of those oils, some of the fats in that oil are going to become oxidized due right. to exposure from oxygen. So, Which makes them no longer good for you, but bad for you because now they're inflammatory. Yes. Right. But that being said, extra virgin olive oil has very few polyunsaturated fats. It's a very uh, stable oil. So Now, in terms of cooking, I still see a lot of people that are really health conscious using olive oil to cook on high heat, like in a frying pan or something like that. What's the deal with the smoke point and at what point? See, me, I would only use olive oil to drizzle on food that's already been cooked. Yeah. I personally wouldn't use it for cooking. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah. It's actually, it is safe to cook with. I mean, you, you typically want to save, um, you know, saturated fats, more fats that are more saturated for higher heat cooking because they're the most chemically stable of the fats that we have available to us. Um, but extra virgin olive oil, it's about 15% saturated fat and monounsaturated fat is also pretty chemically stable. So people in the Mediterranean region, region of the world, they cook with it and Extra virgin olive oil is so packed with antioxidants that it actually, you know, helps prevent its oxidation through the cooking process. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. And also, one thing that I want to add... I mean, is there any risk if you're cooking on super high heat, like you're doing a wok or something, where it's like just blazing, and then you wouldn't want it? Or do you think it's just generally safe for cooking you don't even need to worry about it? It is generally safe. Oh, I cool. Mean, yeah, it is generally cool. safe. Cool. That's good to know, because I, I don't use much olive oil because I got some information somewhere which you know may have been inaccurate or, or become outdated that like oh no it turns bad when you when you cook with it it's too fragile it's not stable enough etc yeah the research that i've reviewed um has found you know even at really high heats um extra virgin olive oil maintains its uh chemical composition the worst oils and also something that i think is really important that you brought up smoke point so smoke point doesn't have a relationship with the temperature at which an oil oxidizes. So some of the most unhealthy. Oh, oils, really? Yeah. Oh, dude, this is cool. I did. I'm, I had a lot of this wrong. This is great. Yeah. So smoke point is largely a culinary concern. Oh, so no way. Yeah. So chefs don't want oils with a low smoke point because it can alter the flavor of the food that they're cooking. Because then the food gets smoky flavor. Exactly. It changes. Dude, that's trippy. Yeah. That's so, f you know, it's so funny when you think you know stuff. And I've been into all of this for years. And, 
granted a lot of people that I interact with know less than I do, you know, sure, they just haven't, yeah. they haven't spent 21 years like geeking out on this. Right. But I always tell people like, oh yeah, never cook with olive oil. It's got a low smoke point. You know, you just repeat yeah. shit that you hear. Yeah. It's, it's funny like that. So it's, it's fun doing these interviews and go, okay, stop telling people that Luke. Now we know better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these, I always use that smoke point thing and you know, yeah. now I know it's okay. Well, these Great. these toxic oils that we're talking about, grapeseed oil, um, safflower oil, canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, they're so heavily refined, right. and they have so few solids in them, if any, that their smoke point is incredibly high. Whereas butter, if you were to cook with butter, butter has a low smoke point, but yeah. it's, not the, it's not the oil being damaged that's causing it to smoke, right? Uh. It's the proteins <clears throat> in the butter. Right. That's why when, because I usually use ghee. I'm like a huge ghee fan. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can put a tablespoon of ghee on a skillet versus a tablespoon of butter and the butter will smoke out the ass right. and the ghee doesn't. It's because the protein's been removed from the ghee exactly. then, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. So we know how to find the best olive oil uh, that it's safe to cook with. What are some other good oils and or, or, or are there any other bad ones we haven't mentioned? Um, oh, you know what? I saw something on your site I want to touch on. Yeah. Uh, was it sweet green? Yes. It's like, oh, I love that. I'm like, this guy's a whistleblower, man. I'm going <laughs> to dig this interview. Yeah. So tell us about the sweet green. And I, li I like that place. I mean, I think, you know, as far as like a healthy chain to eat at, pretty good, like Whole Foods. But yeah. what did you find there? Yeah. So, I mean, I like sweet green, too. I eat there all the time. Um, but Is it sweet greens or green? Green. Okay. Singular. Yeah, okay. Thank I, you. I believe. Thank you. Um, they... Their food, you know, they've got great salads. It's a great, you know, quick, inexpensive option for most people. But uh, they have a toxic ingredient on their menu, and it is <sighs> their salad dressings. Their salad dressings. Are you are guys listening? Anyone? <laughs> uh, not VPs at Sweet Green, yo. Uh, about 10,000 people are going to hear this this week alone. Yeah. So, you know, all of Sweet Green salad dressings are made with grapeseed oil as the primary ingredient. See, that sounds healthy. I'm like, grapeseeds, yeah. that sounds great. Grapeseed is a byproduct of winemaking. It used to be thrown away until one brilliant, industrious, you know, wine manufacturer decided that this could be refined and sold as wow. a cheap, tasteless oil to plug into the food supply. Wow. And Americans, you know. Kind of like the fluoride in the water being a byproduct of the aluminum industry. Yeah. And they got to do something with it, so they sell it to towns and there trick them into thinking it's good for your teeth. You see how multifaceted this, this whole thing is? <laughs> I like love the it. Matrix. I, lo I love yeah. unraveling this stuff, though. It's so fun. But I have a feeling my show is going to increasingly become more conspiratorial as <laughs> time goes on. Because I'm like gaining, I'm like have this plan of gaining the trust of the listeners with all this good information. And I'm like, boop, <laughs> fluoride in the water. Uh-oh, you know. Um, so sweet greens using grapeseed oil. Yeah. Damn, dude. You know what? I think that's what they use at Erwan too. Yeah, they do. A they lot. do? Yeah, in the prepared Sons foods. of bitches. Yeah, so you can still eat at sweet green. Just make your own salad dressing. They have- Okay, they good. Solutions. Have, yeah, they usually have great extra organic, usually extra virgin olive oil. So just make your own salad dressing. But one of the, thing, one of the reasons why grapeseed oil is so bad for you is because, you know, we talk a lot about um, omega-3s and omega-6s and the fact that a lot of the- you know, chronic diseases plaguing modern society are thought to be owed partly to the fact that our consumption of these essential fatty acids have become so f skewed in favor of omega-6 fats, right. which are considered sort of like the pro-inflammatory, you know, omega fat. Um, our ancestral uh, relatives were uh, thought to consume omega-6s um, in a ratio to consume omega sixes to omega threes in a ratio of one to one. Today we're consuming them in a ratio of twenty five to one. So far, you know, the seesaw is wow. far tilted. Wow. Yeah. So grapeseed oil, take a get with grapeseed oil's omega six to omega three ratio, what would you guess that it was? If I told you it was unhealthy, like where would you what would be like a starting place? Uh I would say maybe around twenty five to one. Five to one. Five to one? <laughs> <laughs> it's at, so the the ratio of omega six fats to omega three fats in grapeseed oil is seven hundred to one. Oh my God, that's not yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow, wow. So that and the omega six oils are those are the ones that are really inflammatory, right? Exactly. And are not the omega uh, six? Wait, is it the omega threes and the omega nines anti-inflammatory? Yeah, so basically the... I mean, don't, it wouldn't nature kind of balance them out? 
if they were inherently present in a substance one was going to eat? Exactly. In nature, they are balanced. Right. In nature, they are balanced. It's only in but our But taking modern- the, the byproduct of the wine industry, which is these weird grape seeds, extracting the oil from them is creating something that wouldn't really be consumed in in nature like a deer you know is many, not, yeah. a deer is not going to go up to a fucking yeah. wine vineyard and you know and eat 40 pounds of that oil or exactly. something exactly right? i mean do you know you'd have to eat a countless number of grape seeds to get right. the amount of grape seed oil in your right. you know medium sploosh of grape seed you know oil based salad dressing from sweet green right and so these omega 6 fats are basically the chemical precursors to our body's inflammation pathways and so when we overconsume them, it's thought to drive inflammation, produce brain fog, feelings of depression. So, I mean, if you feel brain fog, just check in with yourself the next time you have a sweet green salad. Although I hope nobody listening to, listening to this will then go and continue to get those commercial, um, you know, salad dressings. But like, if you do have brain fog, if you do feel maybe a little bit anxious afterwards, it's probably because of the grapeseed oil that you just consumed. Dude, that's crazy too. When you get off of all of these foods, these toxic foods that we're talking about uh you at least for me and i want to see if you've experienced this but you get so sensitive Mm -hmm. to eating the bad foods again yeah it's almost like a i wouldn't say it's a curse because you become you feel great and hopefully you're not going to die of alzheimer's or diabetes or something right but it kind of sucks like once you cross a certain threshold man there's a real price to pay for going back over that is every once in a while i don't know i'll eat a thing of fries or Something that's like got those a lot of the really bad fats. Yeah, Same. and I can feel it, dude. The next day, like I'll I'll have my carpal tunnel will be acting up, and I'm like, what the hell? Was I on the computer for ten hours? No. Start running through a little inventory checklist of myself. I go, ah, oh, goddamn it, what did I eat yesterday? Oh yeah, I went crazy with a bunch of bad fats or whatever it was. Yeah, man, it's uh. So it's the it's the double edged sword. It's like good that wow, your body's actually responding in a way that it should when you eat poison. Exactly. Whereas like when your baseline is just shit already and all you eat is poison, you don't even notice it. And this mm-hmm. is the annoying thing trying to talk to someone who eats all that crap and is getting sick and you're like, Well, hey, let's look at the root causes. It's like, No, I've been eating that stuff forever. I, f- I feel fine most of the time. And it's like, Well, yeah, you felt fine because your body's resilient, but at a certain point there's a tipping point where your body's like, F you. Yeah we're done, you're getting laid out with whatever, you know, well, degenerative disease happens to fit your type. Exactly. I mean, that's why today one in seven young people complains of memory problems and why one in six adults is on some kind of psychiatric drug. And I, you know, I think it has something to do with the food supply. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever uh, got into Kelly Brogan's work at all? I love Kelly. Yeah. Kelly's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. She was on the show. For those of you listening, uh, if you're interested in the mental illness component of diet and stuff the kelly brogan episode's really good she's a psychiatrist that effectively gets people off of really intense meds with diet and lifestyle it's crazy okay so um so all of the vegetable oils all of the seed oils all that stuff we want to stay away from what are the really other than olive oil what are the other really good fats that we want to look for if we're like reading the ingredients or we're cooking something or eating out in a restaurant yeah i mean I would say the best by far is extra virgin olive oil, Um, just based on the weight of the literature. You know, there's good, you know, randomized controlled trials where they've used a liberal amount of extra virgin olive oil and have seen reduced uh, markers of cardiovascular risk, improved cognitive function, and even weight loss from adding, you know, more extra virgin olive oil to the diet. That level of evidence doesn't exist for any other fat. No matter what anybody says, um, extra virgin olive oil has a really strong... Uh, sort of, you know, body of evidence to really kind of make it the oil that I feel most comfortable using day to day in my cooking. You know, I drench my salads in it. Um, You're I, inspiring me, dude, because right now I'm thinking, thanks, Luke, where's your olive oil? I do know how to buy good olive I mean, I just basically when I buy olive oil, I just look not to sound like an entitled dick, but I just look for the most expensive one. Hmm. It's in the darkest bottle and yeah. says the most virgin, the most organic, yeah. the most non-fake. <laughs> and I just get that one. But then you know what I do? I put it in my bottom cabinet and I never touch it. It sits there Funny. probably until it goes bad because I didn't really think you were supposed to cook with it. And yeah. I'm not, I, I barely cook anyway. You know, I get like uh, this thing called model meals delivered, which is wow. super legit and paleo whole 30. Wow. Yeah, it's great uh, in Southern California. A little plug for those guys, but I'm like, man, I need to start adding my olive oil 
two things that I'm already, you know, even if I buy a prepared meal, I could drizzle it on the vegetables. And I always eat um, ghee and coconut oil and like, um, you know, brain octane or MCT or something like that. Yeah. Right? But it sucks because both ghee and um, ghee and coconut oil also have a very distinctive flavor. Right. You know, and you don't like ghee is you could pretty much put that on anything, but it does have that really strong buttery flavor. So yeah. it doesn't. It makes everything taste the same. Like anything I cook or even heat up is pretty much like a ghee and protein or a ghee and a vegetable. Hmm. And it all sort of has that same flavor. Yeah. And if you cook with coconut oil, there are certain things that just don't, it doesn't work. Right, it right, doesn't, right. it has that tropical sort of flavor. It just doesn't vibe. Like you wouldn't want to cook some, I don't know, like an Italian or Mediterranean kind of right, dish and try right. to use coconut oil and be like right. oh this tastes like suntan lotion. yeah exactly you know what i'm saying yeah so okay so olive oil ghee yeah. ghee's good ghee's good to ghee's good to cook with i'm not you know i'm not a big you know i guess the term is like to borrow a term from like the stock market i'm not yeah. i'm not super bullish on saturated fat the way i think a lot of people have become these days oh okay because even though saturated fat i think has been exonerated um, now it seems like the pendulum has swung so far into the other direction <laughs> yeah. where it's like people are just slamming saturated fat and I'll give you a That's good, me. That's me. Yeah. Well, and also, and also not good, uh, if you're someone that doesn't eat animal products too, yeah. that's kind of a bitch too. I mean, that's a good case for the coconut oil and the olive oil. Cause a lot of people at different times at least choose not to eat an well, excretion from a cow. Yeah. It, de it depends on what, what else you're eating. I mean, saturated fat can produce inflammation it can potentiate insulin, which basically means that, you know, if you have 100 grams of carbs and let's say, you know, X amount of insulin is secreted to clear that those 100 grams of carbs from your system, shuttle it into your fat cells. If you add saturated fat into that equation, so for many people that means adding coconut oil to their smoothies, it basically causes for the same amount of carbohydrates more insulin to be released. Damn it. Yeah, and going Dude, back you're to... you're blowing up all my recipes. <laughs> I mean, well, so, you know, if you, if, you t if, you take, if you take two, you know, two animals, take, take two cows, right? You feed one grain and you feed the other one grass. Grass is what a cow really wants to eat, right? And everybody knows that grass-fed meat... Or maybe not everybody knows, but grass-fed meat is healthier than grain-fed in part because of its fat composition. A grass-fed cow naturally has less saturated fat in it. So that should give you a clue as to the relative proportions of saturated fat to polyunsaturated fat to monounsaturated fat that we're meant to consume. A properly raised cow has less saturated fat. So that should tell you something about, you know, yeah, about, about the amount that we're meant to eat. And plus, you know, let's not forget, like... We in the in the health and fitness community always say don't drink your calories, right? And that applies to sugary drinks, right? We say that all the time for sugary drinks, but why shouldn't that also apply to some degree to drinks with fat in it? That's funny, dude, because you know, honestly, I, I'm not a foodie. I like if I could stop peeing, pooping, and eating for the rest of my life, I'd be so stoked. Save a lot of, you have a lot more time to do other yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, that's like, I'm always just like, oh, God, I got to eat dinner. It's so <laughs> annoying. I'm doing other stuff. Now, that's, the, you know, the, the community, a nice, you know, going on a lovely date and a nice restaurant, eating with your family, with your friends. I mean, I like the communal aspect. And, of course, some food is delicious. But just day-to-day -day grinding and working, I'm like, ah. So what I end up doing and this started with bulletproof coffee because I have a bulletproof coffee in the morning. And I'm not hungry until four o'clock or something, you know, and I'm still mm -hmm. like that. But I have to admit, sometimes when I'm hungry, I just walk by the kitchen and I just take a swig of brain octane oil, like two tablespoons, like a shot of that. Mm. Or I'll take a bite of ghee, like a spoonful of ghee. Wow. And like, that's my meal. And I just keep it pushing and I yeah. have energy, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I have taken the high fat thing <laughs> to an extreme where sometimes I just kind of only eat fat and not yeah. even so much protein or vegetables. So I have to make myself kind of do that. But in order to like make a, uh, a green smoothie more, um, more filling, I'll put a huge heaping tablespoon of coconut oil or brain octane or something. Yeah. So I'm like, I seem to always be adding fat to everything. Do you think that that might be overkill? Well, it depends. It depends on what your goals are. You know, if your goals include, uh, you know, increased cognitive performance, then in the presence of those carbs, you know, maybe through the medium chain triglycerides that are in coconut oil, or obviously, you know, that's what brain octane oil is. You're still giving your, you know, you're still allowing your brain to run to some degree on ketones, right? Right. If your goals are weight loss, 
um, or even maybe long-term health. Um, I don't necessarily think that adding, you know, an excess amount of calories from fat and added oils and things like that is necessarily a good idea. And <laughs> dude, to be you just solved the mystery maybe of like why I still have a gut. And I'm like that I mean yeah. I and I I I phase in and out of working out. I mean like high intensity interval training, like real workouts, I always move, but I phase in and out of that, but I'm like, dude, I get I'm 47, but like I've had this gut since I was probably 32, 33. It just like boop popped up after having a natural six pack my whole freaking life or uh, but now I have a hard time losing it, but I also eat, I don't even know how many calories I eat. I mean, I get a lot of calories from fat. Calories still matter. That's been right. another misconception. You know, if you're low carb, calories don't matter. You can just eat all the fat and oil and stuff that you want, but you still need to be in a calorie deficit to lose weight. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm probably not. <laughs> you might, you <laughs> might, great. you might not be. And you know, also, when we're talking about the healthiest foods that we could be eating and putting putting into our mouths, we want to think about nutrient density, right? Which basically describes foods that have a high ratio of nutrients to calories, right? Fats are very nutrient sparse. There's a lot of calories, but not very many nutrients. I mean, there's granted some nutrients in butter, for example. You know, there's vitamin K2, there's CLA, there's butyrate, but trace amounts of all right. of the above, you know? Right. I mean, it's predominantly a dense source of energy. And if you are carrying, you know, fat around your midsection, you've got all the energy that your body needs right there. So I'm not, yeah, I mean, I definitely, and don't get me wrong. Like I love bulletproof coffee as a, you know, it's a, it does, um, it's a hunger suppressant. It leads to, you know, a more sort of tempered, uh, release of caffeine into the system and i love the way it tastes yeah that's what i always say it's like a slow drip of caffeine instead of like a shot in the arm you know yeah, yeah. it seems when you you emulsify the caffeine molecule in those fats it does it's like a sustained caffeine high instead of like a jolt you know mm-hmm. um okay so good information there something to consider i'm already rethinking <laughs> my approach is the fun thing about having a podcast yeah at least for someone like me that's just perpetually curious i always want to know more and the next thing and the next thing it's really fun because Dude, I, I can't wait for after no. almo- after almost each interview i'm like okay i'm changing these five things and then the listeners get the benefit of me kind of being the canary in the coal mine and awesome trying different things until i find what works so so as back to related to the brain health Mm uh which of course is from what we're getting at here is almost like all of these issues that come up are really just symptoms of eating things that are inflammatory or poisonous whether they be grains or fat so we've talked and sugars Mm -hmm. right carbs Mm -hmm. so we've talked a bit about the fats and i think we have a pretty clear at least a starting point there now let's definitely get into the grains and gluten piece because to me this seems to be the most inflammatory mm-hmm. food like this is not there's a correlation between eating a bunch of bread and how well you can think yeah i mean it's noticeable especially if you go off of it for a while yeah so i'm i'd say i'm probably if i'm really honest 90 to 95% gluten free Maybe once a month, I go out to a nice restaurant. And I'm like, oh my god, that sourdough bread looks bomb, <laughs> you know. And I'll be like, well, at least it's fermented, you know, so it's not like eating Wonder Bread or you know, some or a donut or something like that. Right. Um, it's probably a better heirloom grain or something. But when I eat that, I'm gonna pay a price. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's worth it sometimes. I mean, bread is a processed food. You know, it's humanity's oldest processed food, but it's a processed food nonetheless. It's you know really rapidly digested carbohydrates that begin to break down. You know, as soon as you start chewing them, thanks to the, the salivary uh, enzyme am- amylase. Um, Don't they, you know your shit, bro? Yeah, you're smart, dude. <laughs> I mean, I'm, Great. I'm obsessed and I've, I've been really interested in it. How long have you been uh, reading and studying this stuff? Well, since I'm, since I'm 15, I've been really interested in health and nutrition. Okay. And then as it all pertains to the brain yeah. for the past six years. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we're eating this highly processed food. So if you imagine the way that – how that sourdough bread ends up on the table, right? Mm-hmm. Your favorite French restaurant. That yummy – really hard baguette you know yeah <laughs> i can picture it now i'm getting started uh so this is a this is a plant we're taking the seed of that plant yeah right mm-hmm. we're grinding that up into a powder mm-hmm. 
and then you know adding eggs adding water adding whatever we add to make that donut or that french bread or whatever it is that yeah. we're doing right so yeah. it requires a lot of processing and that probably wouldn't have happened pre-agriculture right yeah exactly like, there wasn't fields of grain before we started going oh hey you can eat the seeds off this plant if you grind them up and make a weird little doughy paste out of it then all of a sudden because of various reasons in mass we started agriculture and then making tons of that where now people are living off bread exactly let's talk about agriculture whereas yeah. in a in a paleolithic sense you know that's why when people in paleo don't eat grains don't eat bread and stuff because we're trying to mimic what happened before agriculture right yeah okay yeah because prior to the first agricultural revolution when we were hunter gatherers roaming the earth looking for our next meal the world was our buffet and we got to choose from 50,000 edible plant species to get our micronutrients from Wow, that's staggering, dude. Yeah, 50,000. 50, okay, back to the grocery store. You walk in <laughs> Ralph's. Dude, there's probably about 100 different substances yeah. that all of those thousands of products are made out of. Yeah. You ever see the movie uh, King Corn documentary? Yeah. They ago. go in a grocery store and they're like, boop, 95% corn, 80% corn, 70 It's like the whole place is basically corn and sugar, like yeah. I was saying earlier, you know, and I think about it in the context of how we've evolved, where you have 50,000 different things you can eat. Yeah. Okay, carry on. And they predominantly come from three plants, wheat, corn, and rice. So we went from basically eating fit from among 50,000 plants, rich in a diverse array of micronutrients, right. which basically fueled the, the growth of our brains into the modern supercomputers that they are now. And then we turned our backs on that diet when we became domesticated by the few plants that we could grow and harness and create, you know, really high energy foods to supply and feed a growing population. And that paved the way for the fact that <clears throat> since then, our brains actually lost the volumetric equivalent of a tennis ball. So we basically ate a certain way for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years that led to the growth of our brains. And then we turned our backs on that diet and our brains shrank. What about the role of DHA and that whole piece in the in the brain growth and the brain development of being of having human beings near seafood? Yeah. Well, it's believed that access to preformed DHA fat from seafood from land animals uh to get, you know, helped give our brains the building blocks to become larger in size in a much more um, you know, easily used format. So for example, Take the plant-based forms of omega-3s that our, you know, simian ancestors get plenty of. <clears throat> if you're of African descent, your body is actually more efficient at converting ALA, which is the plant-based form of omega-3, to its usable format in the body, which is DHA, which is used, you know, to build healthy brain cell mem uh, membranes. People... Of uh, with newer genes, people of European descent are actually less efficient at converting plant-based forms of omega threes to their usable forms in the body, and it's thought that the reason for that is because those genes came about once preformed uh, omega three fats DHA and EPA became available from you know the animals that we began eating, eggs, you know, buffalo or whatever it, you know whatever the wild land animals were that we were you know cooking over the over the campfire uh and fish as we became more spread out and we you know went to the coasts so um yeah so that's i mean you know all so we go from so we go from 50,000 different varieties of things we can eat and then <clears throat> for a number of different reasons agriculture happens boom right, sort right. of blooms on the planet people figure out hey we can just stay in one spot if we keep all our food right here exactly and then you have the whole, <laughs> then you have the whole, you know, rise of the class system and all that and, yeah. and uh, government and everyone and land owners and, you know, all of that sort of, that's another piece we don't have time to get into, but it's interesting. Agriculture changed the entire game it changed of, of it, human existence. And it changed our brains. Yeah. And so what you're saying is it has affected our brains negatively and yeah. and we've lost a tennis ball of mass, which I'm sure was useful for something. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> right. Yeah. For something, right. Well, as a hunter gatherer, we had to be self-sufficient, right? So we had to know how to hunt, cook, fight. Um, once we made the transition to agriculture, that really was the dawn for the first time in human history of specialization. 
you know, we had somebody to plant the wheat, somebody to pick it, somebody to sell it, somebody to cook it, bake it. And, you know. That- oh, wow, dude. So that you're, that explains some of the brain shrinkage, too, I bet, because mm-hmm. the lack of diversity in day-to-day activity. Right? Along, along with the fact that we became basically slaves to these crops that are right. energy-dense, nutrient-poor. Nutrient deficiencies became more prevalent. So we were not getting enough nutrients. We became slaves to our crops. Basically, you know, the rise of specialization. And in fact, that's why, you know, people with ADHD, for example, which is which might be um, just a modern construct, struggle in jobs that require them to do the same thing over and over and over again. A person with ADHD today might have been the ultimate hunter-gatherer. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So that's why, for example... When you eat uh, wild foods, as I'm sure based on our conversation here, you've tried a bit of foraging and things like that, or even wild foods that you can get, they taste so much stronger. Yeah. Like I recently was in Lake Tahoe and there's this one spring that I like to go collect water from Mm. and watercress just blooms out of this one spring for whatever reason. It's just a field of watercress, wild watercress. And if you get watercress at the health food store, you sprinkle a little on your salad. It's got a little peppery kind of like a radishy sort yeah. of flavor. Dude, you could get wild watercress. I mean, it burns your face off. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's a totally, it's a different thing than yeah. what you would get at the health food store and add infinitum to every single vegetable and herb and, and everything. So good. It's like, yeah, it's like food in its natural state. One of those 50,000 things that we've evolved from eating it's just literally different stuff. When you talk about the calorie density versus the nutrition density, mm-hmm. if you were having to sustain yourself on some wild honey and some animal fat or a fish and right. some wild watercress and whatever, you'd be eating more diverse foods with less calories, yeah. right? With a much higher nutritional value and Much profile higher. and a, a diversity of nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to Alzheimer's disease. So interesting. Yeah, this is good stuff. It's, it's so interesting. So interesting. When you look. Do you have do you have a hard out, by the way? Because I don't know if you're watching the time I am, but I'm like, I don't want to stop because we're writing <laughs> some good stuff. But no, let's keep. You okay. I mean, All yeah. right. Um, when we go, I usually ask that at the beginning so that I can monitor the time, you know, and I would have sped past some stuff yeah. and like made a nice, uh, put a bow on this like a uh, hour long thing. But if you're, if you can keep going, let's do it. Cause this is a lot of great information. Yeah. I mean, I forget. I don't know. What time is it? Um, let's see that. I do know it's five thirty three. I can go. Yeah. Another 15 minutes. Okay, cool. If that's cool. Perfect. Yeah. So. Going back to Alzheimer's disease, you know, when, so the most common Alzheimer's risk gene um, the most well-documented and well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene is uh, the APOE4 allele, which in the United States, if you carry either one or two copies of that gene, it puts you at anywhere between a 2 and 14-fold increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, respectively. Wow. Um, yeah. But that is just... You could be up to 14 times more likely? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. That's substantial. If, you, if you're APOE4-4. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, so here's the thing. So those risk statistics are basically the what you know what seems to be the case when you th- when you push the APOE4 allele up against the modern world with the standard American diet. You can look to other parts of the world where they have that same gene because it's pretty ubiquitous amongst you know human beings, and there's little to no association with Alzheimer's disease. Hmm. So it seems that the interaction between that gene. And the modern world, the modern diet, the post-agricultural diet and lifestyle seems to be what's really putting people at increased risk for the disease. And the APOE4 allele is considered to be the ancestral allele. It's the oldest version with the newer, uh, more protective version seem to have sort of come on the scene later. But if you look at um, in Ibadan, Nigeria, for example, the Yoruba, they have the same prevalence of the APOE4 allele as we do here. And they have, there's far... uh, less of a relationship between it's a far weaker relationship between the apoe4 allele in nigeria and alzheimer's disease and they eat a diet that is way less industrialized than ours has become they eat a lot less sugar um they eat you know just in general much lower uh glycemic carbs you know a lot more beans and stuff like that um and uh 
And so, yeah, I mean, they eat a diet that's more similar to that of a hunter-gatherer. Interesting. So in addition to the, well, what's the other piece with gluten in Mm. that the strain of wheat that we eat now is like has a worse form of gluten and all that. Like what's the what's the gluten situation here? Because I know yeah. people always say, oh, when I go over to Italy and I go over to France, like I'm fine. I'm eating bread and pasta all day long. It must be a different gluten or a different weed. Is that? Yeah, for some gluten, there, I mean, for some, it could be context dependent. For some gluten produces inflammation. Maybe when a person goes to Italy, they're consuming a lot more anti-inflammatory extra virgin olive oil, which helps counter you know, the, the impact of gluten. I don't know, but I do know, what I do know is that in the Western world, we're eating, you know, this, this really unique protein that no human being can properly digest in, you know, which has only been sort of in the American diet for the last second of human evolution. And it seems to have a really unique impact on the lining of our gut. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the context of the standard American diet that has become basically stripped of dietary fiber in the presence of all these other toxic additives that are added to the processed foods that we're eating. Um, and the fact that gluten is just everywhere. It's used to thicken bakery products. You know, we're eating bread with every meal, wheat snacks with every meal. It's in our soy sauce. You know, it's 50% of the soy sauce that we consume when we eat sushi. Really? Yeah. Damn. Wheat. Yeah. We're just we're just over consuming this protein that no human can properly digest. So, I think one to two percent of people have celiac. There's a, a highly underdiagnosed population of people who are um, not celiac but gluten sensitive, and then there are people that are allergic to wheat. So for many people, uh, gluten produces symptoms um, that may or may not coincide with gastrointestinal symptoms. It can produce feelings of brain fog, cognitive, you know, um, not impairment, but, you know, reduced cognitive function. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's something that I've chosen to avoid. Um, Do you ever slip? Are you ever like, whatever, I'm stopping at this donut joint? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I don't because I, and it, it goes back to my mom, you know, I, I uh, my mom was never diagnosed with celiac disease. My mom was a New York Jew, grew up on bagels and matzah and all the crap that, you know, that people were told was totally healthy. Um, and she would eat that stuff because it was low in fat and low in cholesterol and saturated fat. Um, but one of the first things that happened to my mom was she developed, uh, hyperthyroidism actually. Um, and there's a really strong link between celiac disease which can manifest silently with, you know, without uh, gastro, without any, you know, gastro, significant gastrointestinal symptoms um, and thyroid problems, autoimmune thyroid disease because of the transglutaminase enzymes. Gluten for many people can sort of trick antibodies in your body um, to basically attack these enzymes, which are ubiquitous throughout the body, but found, you know, in very high concentrations in the thyroid. And, if you have celiac disease, the um, the chance that you celiac disease coincides with other auto, other autoimmune conditions significantly more so than the those autoimmune conditions uh, overlap with one another. So it seems that celiac disease is this sort of common thread. Um, and if you have any kind of autoimmune disease, your risk for developing dementia increases as well. So, you know, I have a hunch and I'll never be able to prove it, but that gluten played a role, um, at least initially in what my mom developed. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, direct science linking gluten to Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Uh, so you kind of have to connect the dots. Is there, are those dots inflammation? I mean, there's, there's definitely scientific inflammation and autoimmunity. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So autoimmunity where your body's going, Oh, we don't know what to do with these glutinous little proteins. Let's attack it. Yeah. And leaky gut and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. It basically, what, what happens is your, um, you know, antibodies, your immune cells begin to look for cells that look like gluten, gluten, you know, the gluten, um, proteins have markings on them that look very similar to markings that we have on enzymes in our own body. It's called molecular mimicry. 
that's weird. Basically, yeah. That's so, so trippy. So what happens in a person that's eating a lot of gluten potentially or somebody with a, you know, the scientists are, you know, trying to sort of uh, uncover why so many people seem to be suffering from autoimmune conditions these right. days, right? Right. So, um, so yeah, so it seems that in the, in the presence of gluten, the immune system basically th- treats gluten as if it were a germ and then looks for other things that look like gluten throughout the body. And that's where these uh, transglutaminase enzymes fall under friendly fire, essentially, wow. and, and get attacked. And this has that cascade effect of affecting your gut, your thyroid, yep. and, and your brain. Yep. Wow. Okay, in addition, you know what's really sick about this? It's like talking about bread and gluten for as long as we have. I keep fantasizing about this French butcher shop up on, <laughs> up on Third Street. That was the best bread, dude. And I talked to the owners and like, no, no, it's fine. You, you can eat it even if you don't do gluten because it's fermented and the fermentation eats up the bad, you know, whatever stuff. So yeah. it's just hilarious. Like my body or my brain or body's going, yeah, this is interesting, but we should go eat some bread. <clears throat> no, we shouldn't. <laughs> um, what other grains would not be optimal if we really want to you know, uh, sustain our ability to think straight and, you know, grow older without getting dementia and these issues. Are some of the other grains problematic too? Well, the thing is, there's no, there's no biological requirement for grains and there's no evidence that they improve health. And for most people, they're hurting, you know, their health because they're such a dense source of starch and carbohydrates that most people don't need. Um, you know, if you are working out vigorously, which I do, which I'm sure you do, which a lot of people do, and after a workout, you want to have, you know, a bowl of rice, for example, then have that bowl of rice where that anabolic stimulus is actually going to be beneficial. You know, it's going to shuttle that glucose into your muscles where it's stored as glycogen. But for most people that are sedentary, that are listening to this, that are sitting in their cars and going to work and sitting at their desks for hours on, on end, there's, you know, I would try to dissuade people from thinking about grains as healthy food. And, you know, for people... The 90% of Americans are deficient in at least one essential nutrient, you know, so opt for foods that are nutrient dense, dark leafy greens. The consumption of dark leafy greens is, is associated with reduced brain aging by up to 11 years, you know, so I like to tell people to have a large fatty salad every single day. In fact, exactly people that have that eat a bowl of dark leafy greens every day have brains that look 11 years younger on brain scans. Wow. Um, wow. And that's because these greens provide a bevy of micronutrients. You're not going to find those micronutrients in, in grains. They provide Grains provide trace amounts of nutrients, but essentially it's just filler. It's like cattle feed for cattle right. that you don't want right. to be eating. Because it is an agricultural human feed. Basically, so, grain is like yeah. human feed. Yeah. Interesting. Exactly. Never thought about it like that. Hmm. And that's why we're fat. Because when you want to get a cow fat to bring it to market faster to get more money from that animal's weight, what do you feed it? You feed it grains. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's so much more expensive to buy grass-fed meats because it takes longer to raise a cow for slaughter on grass than it does grains. 100%. And it's controversial. That's interesting. But then you think about, you know, middle America where people are eating Costco and GMO f- KFC, whatever, and are typically much uh, more obese. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and they're like almost the factory farm humans. 100%. That are getting their food out of that same system. So yep. we've, we've fed ourselves like we feed our livestock. Exactly. You can, I mean, if you were in an airplane flying over the United States, you would actually see that 60 per, 65% of the planted landmass in the U.S. is dedicated to growing wheat, corn, and soy. Five percent is dedicated to growing vegetables, which should be making wow. half of all of our plates. Wow, dude, interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's a massive economic muscle behind this idea that grains are good for us. That's why it's such a controversial idea, but it's not controversial. We've only had acts. Well, there's you know some evidence that we might have had you know limited grains, tubers, and things like that for you know as hunter gatherers, but they were accompanied by a dramatic, dramatically increase, a dramatic increase in fiber intake. And they definitely weren't pulverized and processed in the form that we're fed them today. Right, right. And especially take brown rice, for example. The hull of brown rice contains, you know, arsenic, depending on where it's grown. And that's a modern phenomenon. It's because, you know, arsenic was used to, uh, you know, in the growing of cotton, basically. So if you buy brown rice grown in the south of the United States, a lot of arsenic in that rice. Wow. So, I mean... I've heard that. Yeah, so that's the beef. Because I, whenever... I don't, I'm not a big rice eater, but when I do... I tend to eat white rice. Hmm. 
and I heard that brown rice is bad for you, and now I know <laughs> what that is all about. That's cool. So tell us about uh, your book, Genius Foods, Become Smarter, Happier, and More Productive While Protecting Your Brain for Life. Yeah. Because around the time this airs, we're going to, I think, be able to time it right where your book will be out. And uh, what's the, the substance of that all about? And, and how did you put yourself in a position to become an author? Yeah. So basically, you know, over the course of this process, learning everything I could about how to prevent um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, I also learned a lot about just the myriad of other ways in which diet and lifestyle affect the brain. So everything from mood to executive function to working memory. You know, executive function is one of these things that some researchers believe is more important to a person's overall success than IQ. It's critically important. And yet there's a really strong link between the same things that are causing us to become obese and insulin resistant and reduced uh, executive <coughs> executive function. So, What is executive function? I don't have enough of it apparently to know <laughs> what that means. Yeah. <laughs> It's important. It's important. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, it's an aspect of our consciousness that we want to, or cognition, I should say, that we want to send on vacation. For example, when we're like watching a movie and we want to become immersed in that movie, for example. But basically, executive function is the set of cognitive processes that include planning, decision making. Oh, okay. Attentional control, oh, focus. Okay. Yeah. So intentional thinking. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Getting gotcha. shit done. Right. We okay. owe to executive okay. function. Okay. So I do have that. Yes. All right. Excellent. Yes. Because you get shit done. Excellent. I <laughs> do. I get a lot done. Yes. Yeah. Too much sometimes. Okay. So yeah. So it's basically a deep dive into that. We also, um, it's the best sort of synthesis of the latest information on nutritional psychiatry. So basically, how diet Ooh. and lifestyle can affect your mood. Um, and it's all there. I mean, it's it's. I basically wrote it to be, um, the the unofficial owner's manual for the human brain. The human brain doesn't come with an owner's manual, but you know, there's this immense body of research now showing how we might care for the brain for optimal performance, not just so that we can survive, but thrive. That's, that's a powerful uh, message because I'm thinking about the brain now and, and there's executive function and there's the things that we're aware of the brain doing and you know we're trying to remember where we put our keys or write a research paper or whatever we're doing, whether it be creative or math or anything. But you have to really consider what the brain also does involuntarily, yeah. right? I mean, the brain is like, that shit is running everything. Yeah. So you might not feel the impairment of the brain, but there might be synapses and things that are totally out of whack that you have no clue and they're manifesting as some other random symptom. Yeah. So I think that's a thing that people could probably have a false sense of security in that. What do you mean? My brain's fine. Like I'm on point. I remember my appointments and they're not, you know, be able to detect any malfunction, yeah. right? But who knows? how it's affecting their neurotransmitters or their hormones and everything else that the brain is sort of up there, you know, puppet mastering, right? Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, I give extremely actionable tools, all research vetted, evidence-based in the book so that you can show up every day as your best and feel great, you know, because what I think is that having a brain that works the way that it should, should be a right and not a privilege. But today, for too many, it's a privilege. And what are a couple of the other lifestyle hacks that you give in the book that, uh, aside from dietary changes that improve the health of your brain? Yeah. I mean, some, you know, some of the lifestyle hacks I'm sure you've talked about before, but you know, I'm a big fan of the, the brain benefits of sauna. So sauna makes us all feel really good, but there's actually a really strong connection between habitual sauna use and, and a really robust, reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease. So research out of Finland found that people that use saunas four to seven times per week had a 65% reduced risk for developing Alzheimer's score. disease. Yeah, score. Yeah, score. Dope. Isn't that amazing? Gotta love the Finns. Yeah. I and just took an hour sauna. Actually, I'm doing a detox protocol right now. Wow. I do an hour sauna every day. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. so you're golden. Right? I've, been, I've had an infrared sauna for 15 years or something, you know, but I didn't know about the brain piece. Oh, yeah. It's super important. And the research out of Finland is particularly important because... You know, if you were to do a study like that, look at, you know, 10,000 people in the United States and examine sauna use and how their, you know, health would progress over a given period of time, it would be really hard to um, assume that the sauna was having a causal, uh, you know, influence on the reduced risk because you could argue that people in the United States that have access to saunas 
have fancy gym memberships and you know oh right yeah, right yeah and do th do things generally that's beneficial to their health eat a healthy diet isn't that funny though how research can be skewed by things like that like 100%. you wouldn't you now you wouldn't necessarily think of that so so what's the deal in finland then so in finland finland is the sauna capital of the world they right. have one sauna. that's where the word comes from yeah exactly sauna sauna yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so there you know using a sauna is like taking a shower it's just so embedded into like the routine of daily life that it provides, I think, a much stronger case as sauna as being this like really right. potent. Not just something rich people do when they go to Equinox or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Wow. Interesting. All right. So what else besides saunas? Give, give me a rapid fire. Just a couple other like great things that people can add to their lifestyle if they want a good brain. <clears throat> well, I think optimizing sleep is criti critically important. We now know that your brain is actually cleaning itself out when you sleep of toxins that build up during the day. Um, this is due to the newly discovered glymphatic system. So in the book, I give ways on sort of optimizing how the glymphatic system works, given how little we know about it currently. There are some insights that have come out from, you know, animal trials and things like that. I talk a lot about physical exercise and, you know, how to really make your workouts more efficient. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not a fan of long bouts of cardio. I've never been. Uh, oh my god so boring dude yeah so boring horrible yeah hard on the, hard on the joints also can yeah. lead to elevated levels of cortisol which are not good can shrink the memory center of the brain really yeah interesting yeah chronically elevated cortisol interesting so mar are marathon runners like stressed out a lot then yeah marathon runners people that yeah. do ultra marathons i mean they're not typically the picture of health interesting um yeah that's, that's true you know i don't i don't often look at someone who's a dedicated av avid runner or a marathoner and be like wow i wish i had that body yeah i mean it just you know it defies nothing no judgment not against that it's just an observation well it just def from an evolutionary standpoint it doesn't seem like it w you know that kind of activity would have been something that we would have been that would have been very useful to us you know i mean interesting according to optimal foraging right. theory a lion's not going to chase you for 25 miles yeah or whatever. exactly <laughs> but sprinting on the other hand you know we've yeah. got we've got a huge proportion of fast twitch muscle fibers you know so getting out of harm's way really quickly um doing really high intensity work uh seems to be really beneficial and can you know boost cardiorespiratory fitness in a fifth the time by doing really high intensity like interval training Right, right. Um, Which is good for your brain. Good for your brain. Yeah. It's been shown recently to boost BDNF yeah. and improve cognitive function. Okay, cool. What else? Um, generally, I, just, I think, you know, just movement, imbuing your day with more mm -hmm. movement, um, really important. Cold immersion uh, has been shown to cause a robust increase of a neurotransmitter involved in vigilance and attention called norepinephrine. Um so I'm a big fan of, you know, using cold. You do cold showers? I do. Yeah, yeah. I do cold showers. In New York too? I do them in New York and I also I have a I'm nice. lucky I have a terrace in New York, which I you know, I sometimes like nerd out on my Instagram where it, I call it free cryo. I step out of my terrace and it's like freezing. Oh, that's amazing, yeah. dude. That's amazing. Yeah, I I'm a I take cold showers every day. I actually very rarely even turn the hot water on really now that's not much to brag about macho wise in la in the summer because the water's like freaking 65 or 70 <laughs> or something yeah but right now it's pretty cold i yeah. you know i keep forgetting to take the temperature of the water but i would guess it's probably in the 50s hmm. i'd say it's pretty chilly because it comes from the colorado river hmm. you know and uh so so the cold showers in la are good but man it's another level when you go to new york so I travel there a lot for work, and you go to New York, and oh, yeah, in the winter, just do the cold showers there, or anywhere cold. I mean, I go to Colorado sometimes too. It's the same thing. You're like, wow. oh man, this is a lot different than LA. It's it it's pretty it's pretty intense, especially yeah. if you don't do the hot water at all. Yeah, it gets yeah. really it gets so really cold so the cold. And then what about cryo and ice baths for brain health? Yeah, I mean, same they, same they, deal. Yeah, they both cause. It's actually interesting. So so you know, one group actually isolated the sort of epicenter of norepinephrine release in the brain as being ground zero for Alzheimer's disease. And when you take these cold showers, there's been no research on cold showers and cold water immersion and Alzheimer's disease. But, okay. hypo, you know, there's this really interesting link between the um, epicenter of norepinephrine release in the brain, which is called the locus ceruleus, and Alzheimer's disease. And it seems that there's a really tight relationship between um, loss of norepinephrine in the brain and Alzheimer's disease progression. So, 
you know, it's an area where, you know, there needs to be more research. Right. But I, I think that it it seems to be really good for the brain um, in a subjective sense. And I would... I mean, those correlations are just like common sense, too. I mean, to some you, degree, yeah. I mean, you can look at that and be like, all right, there's no studies for you skeptics, but it's <laughs> like, it kind of makes sense, you yeah. know, obviously. Yeah. That's and, and also from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, we've never before the industrial, you know, age, of course, lived permanently at 68, 69 degrees. Yeah. Like, we're just, we literally are not designed for that. Yeah, it's, it's not good for Because you think, you watch movies like, what was that DiCaprio movie where the bear jumps on him and shit? The, the Revenant? Yes. Like, that movie was so brutal because you got to see, and, the, and that's not, I mean, that's even post-agriculture, obviously, and it was, there was some industry happening and technology happening even by then, but just how rugged people lived a couple of few hundred years ago. Yeah. I mean, I watched that movie. I was like, oh my God, aren't they cold? Like, God, that <laughs> must suck. You have this freaking like, you know, um, uh, fur around you. You're riding a horse through Montana for three days. I mean, it's freaking brutal. I don't, I can't even go camping anymore. I'm freaking out. Like, eh. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like humans are wired to be resilient because we've had to adapt to that environment. But now we live and again, back to the domestication piece and the agriculture thing. It's like now we live where we're not exposed to those temperatures and it's crazy. And I don't, you probably experienced this too, where like you do cryo or ice baths or saunas or whatever. And you're someone that's been doing this for a long time as am I and a few of my friends. But when I bring someone new into the fold mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, let's go take an ice bath. They're like, sure, let's try it. And they get in and they're like, <laughs> I mean, they're literally like, I'm like scared they're going to have a fucking heart attack. And I'm like, dude, it's the water's 45 degrees. Like it's chill out. You know, I don't, I don't remember what it's like to be, have a nervous system that's that weak, yeah. weak sauce. You know, it's like we're supposed to be able to do that. And the fins, man, they, they get in a sauna, then they go, they cut a hole in the lake, the frozen lake, they go jump in there, they get back in the sauna. Like there's nothing that feels better, but I think that places like that, that haven't lost touch with that heritage, yeah, you know, is the people tend to be healthier and more resilient, but it's just crazy. Even I'll have someone over and throw them in the sauna and five minutes are like, oh, I got to get out. I'm like, it's an infrared sauna. It's not even that hot in there. Your body gets heated differently from an infrared sauna. It's right. I think mine's usually about 155 at the max, which isn't, I mean, it's hot. It's not that hot though. Hmm. Some of those barrel saunas will get like 220 or something, you know? Dude, I but like I, 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 yeah, but it's, I get someone in there, I'm like, oh my God, that's so sad. <laughs> it's, we're not supposed to be like that. We've evolved to be walking across the freaking Sahara and just chilling with it, you know? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, going into a sauna simulates some of the Bennett, some of the, you know, the machinery of aerobic exercise. I mean, your heart rate increases. It's been shown actually recently to improve vascular compliance, which is basically like, um, the ability of your blood vessels to sort of expand and contract um, in a really fluid, dynamic way. So, yeah, saunas are a really powerful form of thermal exercise um, and cold, too. You know, Awesome, dude. So, okay, so it sounds like a rad book. I'm, I'm happy that we're able to time this Thanks. in that moment. So we've got dietary and lifestyle recommendations, and they're all geared toward the brain health. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Cool. And and then tell me again what what's the deal with the uh, with the breadhead doc? So that's you've got you have an edit you're happy with, and now you're shopping it to the film festivals, and and it, you anticipate that coming out this year in 2018 as well. Yeah, that's my hope. That's my hope. We're okay. waiting to we don't you know we're we we have a great sales agent. We're trying to sort of see if we can go the traditional route. I mean, you know, I think it's a very topical. An important topic, obviously. I mean, I think it's the most important topic there is. There's quite so, a few best-selling books, you know, kicking yeah. around too that cover that. So yeah, it's important, I think, for people that don't read books <laughs> yeah. to have another way to get the information. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm I'm optimistic, and if we can't find a you know for whatever reason like a good uh, distribution deal to make sure that people are actually able to see it, then we'll do the digital route, you know, because I'm right. I'm totally open to that. You know, I yeah. think uh, we live in a new world where you know, content that's good will get out there. You don't need the Netflixes. I mean, it would be great to work with a company like that. I respect them. Yeah. But you don't need anybody. You can well, just your book is published by Harper's, right? 
Yes. So you got that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, know I mean? <laughs> you know, if you had to do like self-published book and, you know, digital only, <laughs> you know, hosted on your website movie, you already got like a legit real yeah. book deal, you know. So, That's man, if, man if, you, if you nail the uh, the uh, film as well and get the right distribution in a studio behind it, that would be a double win, especially in a year. So That's my hope, man. Good for you, dude. We'll see. Good Thank for you. you, man. Thanks for your, your you. research and your passion. And, you know, thanks for coming on and doing this and for – being a good son man and trying to figure out what the hell's going on with your mom I, I as i told you before record i relate to that because my mom has lyme disease and so it's you know it's been 20 years or something and there's not been a definitive answer to it uh but i have found something that's right over here actually i could show you when we're done it's called the amp coil and it's very promising for that but i know man that's the thing it i find most people really start to get into this stuff like you and i clearly are when A, it hits you and you get a disease or you have something or it's someone that close to you. It's like, this is unacceptable. Mm. It's not like, you know, if somebody gets hit by a car, right? They lose a leg. I mean, it's sad, but it's just, well, what are we going to do? Stop walking around the city and stop driving cars? No, it's just part of it. But so much of the suffering is preventable. And I think that's what fuels me. And obviously you're doing a book and a movie. That's why I work my ass off doing this podcast mm -hmm. because if it's not like I'm trying to save the world, but like think of there's enough human suffering if we were still hunter gatherers, yeah. you know what I mean? Even without all this bullshit, like we would still have a lot of uh, challenges to face, but so many of our challenges now, especially when it comes to health and just mental health and psychology and our emotional state and spiritual state, so much of that is treatable and preventable. Yeah. You know, it's like, it really is so much of it comes down to lifestyle. So it's, it's, it's really important work that you're doing. Thank you, man. I appreciate And same to you. Like, we're both, I think, you know, we're, we're teachers, you know? That's what it seems to be. It's, yeah. That's what our calling is, right? I have an obsession with truth. I think yeah. that's what it is. Like, I just want to know the real deal. That's like, I get excited when you tell me about the new olive oil <laughs> research or whatever. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I thought I knew the truth, but there's a deeper level of truth or a more broad understanding of that truth, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good times. All right, so in closing, I got my final question, which is, You've taught me a lot today, and of course you've taught the audience a lot. Who have been three teachers or teachings sort of up the food chain from you that we might go to to learn from, whether it's on these topics or otherwise? Yeah. Well, I would say for one, I mean, the first name that came to mind, you know, early on in my life, I was sculpted by uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti. I was really into his writings, The Awakening of Intelligence, Freedom from the Known. Those were really good, um, I guess... Uh, early um, sort of, you know, I was, I was really exposed to the idea that we should, you know, be true. We should each be truth seekers um, and to question authority and to uh, never be afraid to ask questions. Um, so I would say definitely, definitely Krishnamurti, Another mentor of mine, um, his name is Dr. Richard Isaacson. He is a neurologist. Um, he runs the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Weill, Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. Um, I've helped him with, with research. He's doing incredible work, and you know he's both a mentor to me. He's taught me a lot about science and research and has been a major supporter and uh, has welcomed me into his clinic. And so, you know, for, for this you know, journey of mine. He's been a really great person to sort of have, you know, in my corner. And then, man, who else? Well, I guess, you know, I, over the course of writing the book, I worked with uh, my co-author on the book. His name is Dr. Paul Graywall. Uh, I feel kind of nerdy. I'm naming two doctors, two of the three. But um, he's a really good friend of mine, and he's a really great guy, brilliant uh, medical doctor, and we collaborated in writing Genius Foods um, because I really wanted, over the course of the book, I mean, I wanted to write about very high-level research and evidence, but um, aside from being really actionable and really practical, I also wanted a medical, clinical perspective on the recommendations that I was giving in the book. <coughs> in, in the book. So we go deep into... You know, the book is actually, I mean, I, I call it an owner's manual for the brain, but it's actually a manual for life. I mean, we go deep into the very best research on cardiovascular disease. You know, so if you have, if you have heart disease risk in your family, you'll understand by reading Genius Foods, cholesterol and lipids, blood lipids, better than any other book. 
you know, because I, I learned this stuff from the ground up. I learned it because I wanted to really understand it. So I'm not, you know, I didn't have an academic medical school background where I had to sort of unlearn everything to put it into terms for the layperson. You know, I really learned it just based on my own research. And I really had to uh, come up with analogies and ways to sort of integrate it into my understanding of biology. And so, um, so yeah, so we have like, you know, a, a really great clinical perspective on heart disease, on metabolic, <clears throat> metabolic health. And it's also a really fantastic, not to, not to like pitch the book, but it's also a really great um, weight loss manual because Paul um, was obese going through medical school and he realized that he wasn't being taught anything about how to fix his metabolism. So, I mean, you know, it's kind of shocking, but doctors are not trained about nutrition or exercise. So Paul was obese, probably compounded by the fact that medical, medical school is so stressful. Um, and he really had to sort of you know, go out on a limb and do his own research. And, you know, what he learned about nutrition and metabolic health helped him to permanently lose 100 pounds. So those teachings are integrated into the book. And it's, you know, we had this really great um, working relationship. And yeah, he's one of my good friends. So I've learned a lot over the past, you know, couple of years from him. Awesome, well. man. Awesome. You're fortunate to have that. I, I think it is valuable when you're putting uh, out information that goes contrary to a lot of existing dogma to have that that science bit, you know, it's something I like to do on the show is interview like the super deep hardcore nerds. I can barely understand what they're saying <laughs> to give validity to some of the more, you know, like uh, the hippie people that come on the show that are more metaphysical and just into herbalism and all this stuff that's not quote unquote provable mm -hmm. or, you know, how important it is to get out and get sun or ice baths or a lot of stuff that we've talked about. And it's like you have the subjective proof of wow i'm healthy and i'm happy because i'm doing xyz but then you bring in the big guns of the neurosurgeon that tells you why an ice bath is worth doing yeah. you know it's i think it's important to have that because there's a certain certain type of people are really wired to require that verification before buying into an idea mm -hmm. you know and some of us like myself i'm more intuitively guided i just I pay attention to the research, but I'm not going to read a friggin' 100-page white paper on omega-3s. I just try to find the most badass expert on it, interview them, and then take what they say. But it's got to make sense uh, intuitively. But there are a lot of people that really want, like, all right, show me the studies and show me the data before they want to make any changes. So smart of you to bring that piece in. I'm glad that your, uh, your influence or mentor there is someone you got to actually work with. Absolutely, yeah. That's I mean, good stuff. Well, yeah, that's the thing is that I, you know, I'm really, I am dedicated to evidence, you know, and I, I remain uh, skeptical of new ideas, but never cynical. You know, I think that's, right. I think that's really important. I think a lot of people, right. are, especially in the pro-science movement, um, you know, are more cynical than they are skeptical when really you should be skeptical. And at the end of the day, science is, uh, it's not like this you know, this universal, like, you know, code of truth. It's a method of finding things out. We can all right. do science in our lives. Right. And, um, but yeah, in terms of health, I really want to, you know, I really wanted to provide like an evidence research based, um, back, you know, backing because there is a lot of amazing research out there that's, that's worthy of our optimism. And, that's not what I experienced in doctor's offices with my mom. I experienced diagnose yeah. and adios. I experienced yeah. a panic attack. <laughs> diagnose and adios. That's yeah. great. That's a, that's a good tweetable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right on, dude. Thanks for doing the work and thanks for bringing your expertise to the Lifestylist podcast. In closing, where can people go to find you and your content and social media and stuff? Definitely uh, pick up Genius Foods. It's, you know, on Amazon. Follow me on Instagram at Max Lugavere. Uh, also on Facebook, Max Lugavere. And um, yeah, I've got a bunch of good articles on my website, maxlugavere.com. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Good to meet you. Thanks, dude. Same.